And let's see. I did not finish my lotion. I'm so glad I got this in here. Um, and then and I just I need to lotion. I need to um okay. So I think that I am live. Good morning to you. Um, I feel like one of those moments where I want to do my little recitation of we're all in our places with bright, shiny faces. However, um, I know that sometimes it takes folks a minute to come in and to uh, get here. And I think that that's why I usually spend the first five minutes just jaw jacking, talking. I um, will tell you that, um, you know, so it came to mind this morning that my cousin planted a seed in my head, Katita. Anyway, um, you know, last week when I had that little um, accident, I don't know, did I want to call it an accident? Because it wasn't, it was accidental, but I ran into that manhole cover and, um, and it ripped off my oil pan on my car, my oil pan plate, whatever you call it. And um, it was, um, yeah, so that was, the, wasn't like something that was just like, oh, wow, it's something that's like, damn. Anyway, um, when it happened, I was telling my cousin about it because I talked to my cousin um, who was out in Seattle and they are in a heat wave at the moment. She was like, um, well, I hope you don't have the other two. And I'm like, what do you mean the other two? And she was like, well, you know, things happen in threes. And so I was like, yeah, not for me, right? Because that has not been my situation. I tell people I live a charmed life and just good things happen to me all the time. And they do, right? Just one good after another, after another. And um but this morning when I woke up, I will tell you, yesterday I overslept. And I don't know if you heard me say to Stephanie that um, I have, I, I use those air conditioners that you normally stick in the window. Well, I have one that was in the living room and I have hardwood floors in, up in the front of my house. Beautiful hardwood floors. But um, so I had one of those, um, roller air conditioners that I used to use in the living room. And I thought to myself, you know, why go through the trouble of plugging up a window with an air conditioner when I can just roll this one back into my bedroom and, um, and be done with it. And I have carpeting on my bedroom floor. Um, yeah, it's kind of plush kind of carpet on my bedroom floor. And um, so I rolled the air conditioner back there and stuck it in my window because I wanted to sleep comfortably. Now, you know, whatever. And um, this morning when I woke up, I go to, because I only run it at night, because I don't really like air conditioning. It makes me congested, as you can probably tell, for the last couple of days, mornings I've been congested. So um, I rolled the air conditioner in my room, ran it last night and the night before. Well, this morning when I get up, I go over to cut off the air conditioner, because I don't run it during the day. And my carpet was wet. So since 4.30, I've been in there with um, soaking up the moisture out of my carpet. And um, yeah, that's been a chore. It's been a chore. So 
when Rhonda asked me this morning, what did I do for exercise? I was like, I was stomping grapes because that's what I felt like. I was putting things down on the floor and then absorbing them. But I will tell you that I had one of those um, towels, I guess you could call it, that they used to sell in the store during the demo that all you got to do is lay it on top of the carpet. It's kind of like a gold cover and it absorbs the water and and then you can squeeze it out. Well, that's what I was using. I got quite a bit of water out of there. And um, I'm just kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen with that. So, but you know what? I am always like up for the challenge. Remember I was saying to y'all the other day when I was talking about, you know, I'd be like, God, is this the best you could do? <laughs> so um so I'm always up for the challenge of of seeing things for the blessings that they are because while on the surface it might appear as if it is um a challenge it might appear as if it is for some folks it would be catastrophic um Mm, got to make sure the drain plug stays in. So I have a hose that is on there. And that hose, good morning. Um, and that hose I have in, you know, going into a little bucket that I keep there. And the bucket has been dry. Um, yeah, so I'm maybe I'm doing it wrong. I don't know. But thank you for that. I will look for... I, no, 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 no. Here is what it is. Because this never happened when it was in there on the hardwood floor because I would have seen it immediately. Um, so I guess that darn thing is coming out. Of, it's out already out of my bedroom. <laughs> I rolled it into the hallway. And um, yeah, so I don't know. It, it seems to be working. Um fine other than it wet up my doggone carpet which is just um you know it's yeah 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 so um good morning <laughs> good morning good morning good morning so um i'm not blaming this on my cousin uh because she says it happens in threes i'm not blaming it on that because <laughs> you know it is what it is and i'm not even gonna get caught up in all of that we're working out of anatomy of the spirit for those of you who may just have tuned in for the first time um and i have not yet received any word from stephanie so i will assume that she is still going to join us at some point today but you know this is um to be able to do this work, right? So whether we are talking about um, how to deal with transforming what um, may seem like challenges or misfortune into the positive, I am so glad that you guys are on this journey with me. Um, one of the things I did not get any writing done this morning because I've been dealing with that. Um, I got a little bit of exercise in, mostly um, stomping grapes, <laughs> mostly doing uh, the the piece about you know being in there trying to get up that water. Um, but I but I did get some promptings to do some you know some 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 core work. So I did a little bit of core work. And, um, but I, I was like adamant that I had to get in some prayer and meditation. And so that is what I did this morning. That is all I was able to manage. And so I am so grateful and thankful to be here and to be working through um, this, this information with you guys. So, so good morning. I am... I am so excited about um, this piece here on intuition. And a lot of times um, when I come to or we come to this particular 
um, thing, what happens for us is, is anytime we are talking about something, you get real life experiences that happen in your life, right? And so things will start to pop out at you that you didn't notice before. So even sometimes when we talk about intuition, I talk about normally the ways in which um, like you can hear something either audible or you hear it in your inner ear, like a still small voice, like a whisper. Sometimes you see words and those words will appear either at the bottom of your vision thing or at the top. Sometimes you'll get impressions or pictures. Sometimes you will feel something in your bones with a certainty or surety, and you don't know where it came from. You have all kinds of things that will just begin to happen for you. Pop, 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 pop. The other thing that I sometimes fail to say is, is that things will come to your attention that you might have walked before, a past, walked past a hundred times before. And today or on this day, it just pops out at you. So like, say, for instance, yesterday, I did the same thing when I climbed out of bed yesterday, I went over, I pressed the button to turn off the, the air conditioner. I saw the little vents go down and everything but never noticed that the floor might've been moist. But today when I walk over there and I stepped into a wet spot, at first I was thinking to myself, to the dog, I looked at the dog like, what did you do? And she looked back at me like, didn't you see me over there sleeping on your rug by your bed? I wasn't even on my own bed. So she has a little bed that's down there right by the air conditioner. She wasn't even on that. And so when I stepped on the spot and I was thinking, what did you do? Um, then I realized this is a little much for um, a wet spot for her, right? And then I touched her little thing and that had um, felt a little moist. This one of those fuzzy ones, that felt a little moist. So I was like, okay, she didn't do all of this. I mean, even... Even on a bad day, she don't have anything like that. So I was like, that's when it, I got the clue that it must have been the air conditioner. And was so normally stuff you can just pass by. And then all of a sudden it seems to pop out at you, you know? So sometimes it's a flower. And if the flower, all of a sudden you notice the flower and you hadn't noticed it before, sometimes what you have to do is turn and look and think, what's the message here for me, right? And, and the message sometimes can be um, something very deep and profound if you are able to hear it. Sometimes it is about the unfolding, uh, something unfolding in your life. It could be anything, but, but the, the, the point is, is that intuition shows up in a number of ways without being some visual movie screen or something that like the way that they portray it, right? They portray it in the movies like, um, like you're going to see something unfolding. Um, in, in that movie that I just saw, um, I just, not, not movie, but it was a mini series called The Underground Railroad. One of the things that the guy saw was he saw himself getting hit by a train in, um, in the Underground Railroad in one of the underground uh, tunnels. He saw himself getting hit by a train. That's not what happened, actually. Um, but, but it was, that was his visual thing. And so sometimes when we see it, on the big screen, we think that that's how intuition happens, but it's not. It is sometimes it is other kinds of images that don't point directly at what's about to happen, but sometimes it'll give you a clue that something will happen. I often tell people about the time that um, when my right before my mother got sick, I had a dream about her, um, I had a dream about her passing it was what it was. I, and I immediately, it was like, I was, I woke up with my pillow soaked. I woke up crying. 
And, you know, I woke up with that thing like, oh, God, let this not be um, true. Let this not be what's happening. Right. And so, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, Stephanie says she's having a problem logging in and, um, and her phone line, you know, Stephanie works. Um, yeah, actually, she, she does a, a couple of different jobs. Um, but she does um, troubleshooting on the phone line for that insurance company. And so she said her phone has been really ringing off the hook. It's not every day that she's working. Like yesterday, you saw her sitting down and able to just kind of focus in. But today she apparently is back um, at it. And so um, I'll just let her know that I got her message and that that is well and um yeah so so but but that's so when we talk about intuition and 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 one of the reasons why self esteem is so major and important to intuition is because if you don't have the ability to believe in yourself then you don't have the ability to believe in spirit and what spirit will say to you um, and so that's part of the reason why we cultivate that, that whole thing. My hair looks like it's flying away, but it's all good because uh, it's my hair. Thank God. Thank God. Right. Um, you know, whatever. Um, it might not, well, might not always be, but, um, but today this is my stuff. Um, okay. So, and um so, so let me back up because yesterday I, I finished up. I was, I was, um, <laughs> okay, Stephanie. So, so yesterday as I finished up, we were finishing up this one paragraph that I thought was totally dense with information. And um, we will, so part of, part of this is, is about how we see ourselves. So I asked a question about what do you, the, the other day, this was a couple of days ago, but what do you base your self-esteem upon? Or what do you base your self-worth upon? And so I kind of talked a, a little bit about how many people, um, get their sense of worth. And usually it is tied to something that you do, something that, um, something that you perceive yourself to be. So when somebody asks you a question like, who are you? I, I mean, this is even difficult for, you know, for me, want somebody who works this stuff all the time. When somebody asks you who you are, usually you'll give them a name, um, and then you might relate it to um, what you do in the world, right? Sometimes people will come up to you and ask you, what do you do for a living? As if that somehow is um, indicative of who you are. I can remember back in the day, um, especially remember I was telling y'all about, I used to go to the Black Professionals Association. And while I had a great position, I was working for the city of Cleveland in a supervisory role, which was a storekeeper um, at the time. Um, I went to work in jeans and Timberlands, right? I, I had on steel toe boots and a t-shirt every day. And so before I went to the black professional meetings, I was changing out of all of that, getting the dust off of myself because in my mind, if I was a professional, it didn't matter that on my job, I had a supervisory role. It only mattered that I could go to work, you know, clean, you know, with heels on and, and you know, nice, what I considered nice clothes, not a nice pair of jeans. And so it was one of those things that, that I think all of us in our minds, we have a fixed notion about what it is that is success and what success looks like. But is it your job? And, and for me, it was not. It was never about what I did because I didn't think that my the, what I did for a living was who I was. Who I was was different from what I did. 
I, you know, it's, and it's interesting because I have known people who, who do ministry work, right? Just like I do. They come to Sunday, come in on Sundays and they be clean and they, in they, you know, suits and they're all of their stuff. But during the week, they worked another job back in groceries, right? And so, and so there's this, you know, there's this disconnect when we have these images about how our esteem is connected to the ways that we make money. And so when those two don't come into alignment, sometimes you have issues with how even you see yourself. Until we recognize that what we do is not who we are. I mean, to some extent, it is as if we all have a desire for what it means to be our best self, right? So if it's your mission statement or if it's what you aspire to, by all means, have in front of you, before you, what it is, how you want to present yourself in the world. But if you are not there, do not let that dissuade you from falling in love with the you that you are. It becomes part of this thing of, and, and I say this and I say it across the board because it goes as far as your profession is concerned. It goes as far as your self image or your body image is concerned. Don't wait until you are the 142 pounds that you desire to be. Do it when you the 240 pounds that you actually are. Do the exercise of looking in the mirror and saying, I love you. Forgive yourself for whatever condemnation that you have over yourself, over your body, over all of that stuff. Work through those issues where you are with what you have. And then when, when the two come together, if they come together, you are already in a place where you love and accept yourself. But you can't, if you're sitting up in, in whatever place you are in, if you're sitting up miserable about, about your job, miserable about your weight, miserable about your relationship, miserable about your home situation, if you're miserable, if you are sitting in misery, it is hard to get to a place of self esteem, especially not if you are stuck in that critical judgment mode about yourself or anybody else. You got to stop. And, 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 and I'll tell you one of the ways to get there. It is just practicing gratitude sometimes, right? Sometimes just practicing gratitude works because what tends to happen is, is that even when, um, you know, say for instance, I mean, whatever happens, right? I mean, any old thing can happen. You can, you can lose the weight that you want to lose, or you can get the relationship that you think you want to get, or whatever. You can get all of those things, but then sometimes stuff happens, and you get right back in the situation that you're in, because sometimes we are where we are by right of consciousness, right? And until we change our consciousness, we have that snapback stuff. And so, um, and so there's a lot of times something that we need to unpack or work through in order for us to have that staying power of being in a place of bliss like we desire to be. So when I say practice gratitude, even if you, as you look at your body, if you are the 242, right, that you don't want to be, and I'm not judging that, right? But if you are there in that space, just being able to love all the parts of you, just being grateful for what you have. The fact that you got enough food to sustain a 242 is a big deal. <laughs> My mother would say to me sometimes, there are people starving in, 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 you know, in Africa. That's what she would say. But there's people starving in other places. Some people can't get enough food. Some of these kids out here don't get any hot meals. I mean, be grateful for what you, for where you are, for what you have. 
but then work on it. Remember, I think last week I was talking about, you know, how our, we got to tell our minds, I'm running this, right? My body does not dictate to me what I eat. Don't tell me about cravings, right? Because now I'm changing my mind about that. You have the ability and the power to work through that. And part of that is and comes from this thing called self-esteem. So let me, cause I, cause I can, I can sit up and y'all know I could go, I could go, I could go, but let me, let me go back into this because I said that we would talk today about this woman named Sandy who went to her workshop and um, yeah, we, so, so let's talk a little bit about Sandy for a second. Um, do, 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 do. Um, anyway. So in one of her workshops, she says, um, a woman named Sandy commented proudly that she had spent the last six years in India in an ashram developing her meditation practices. And so every morning and every evening, she would enter into an hour long meditation. And, um, and was able to receive spiritual guidance. Now, you know, I let me stop there prayerfully because I got I got something to say to that. First off, um, so this morning I told you guys about idea prayer and meditation. It is not something that I normally. I mean, sometimes I share it, but you know, it's not an everyday occurrence. Um, sometimes what we have a tendency to do is, is when I talk about esteem and I said, um, what do you base your esteem on? So many of us have something that we are, that we base ourselves upon or that, that we talk about because we, it gives us a sense of, um, I don't know, some kind of sense of pride that we or, talk about before honor. Really sorry. Um, my, my, uh, my, my screen wasn't working over here. So when it's not working, I can't really see if somebody uh, says anything or anything. And, and other than that, I can't really see who's here other than when you type something in the window. So I appreciate it. And I see that Stephanie had typed something in the window. So thank you. Um, so, so this idea that we have something to hang our hats on or something to, you know, to feather our, our caps with is, is for so many, it's important. Um, so you will see people who will be name droppers or, um, people who will, um, whatever their thing is, they will talk about that particular thing. Um, in this case, when, when it says that, that she volunteered the information that she had spent six years in an ashram in India, it is something that gave her bragging rights. Now, I'm not saying that that's what Sandy was consciously doing. I'm not saying that that is why um, she said it, well, you know, but, but she is using this person as an example. So I'm using her as an example too. Sometimes we will talk about um, what we do at church or every other word will be praise the Lord and thank God and blah, 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 blah. So people will try to wear their religion on their sleeve so that you know um, that they're supposedly blessed. Give me one second. Mm, here. Yeah, I can see I love to do this. Did I just, um, I was off, whatever. It, it was, uh, it was, it's all good. Um, in here, in this book, this is another one of my favorite little books. This was um, something that I read years ago. And when I just said this, one of those intuitive things just hit me. Like I saw a page, just like I was telling you, 
that I, I see pages and I saw a page and I was like, okay, if I get this book, I can find this section um, right off. And, um, and sometimes I get really impatient with myself because if I don't find it right off, then I trip. Oh, you guys, I didn't see this, right? Um, but as I was flipping through here, so I, I tell y'all about how I do this all the time, right? So sometimes what I'll do is, is as I highlight, I write down stuff that um, I want to come back to. I highlight it, and this has like two different colors, really. Um, and then it's got some pin marks in here. And um, I, it's been years ago that I read this. So let me, um, let me see why I stopped at this page. Um, humankind has constructed codes of behavior at every level of consciousness, and you no longer accept your own personal responsibility. You go to your laws, your rules to tell you what to do. And you think that in that in that way, you can avoid individual responsibility. Has that worked? Have the sexual codes laid down in the dark ages under which you are still operating, giving you fulfillment? I suggest you become aware of your own sexuality. This is, I should have read this back when we were doing sexuality. Claim your own reality and do the things that make you feel creative, dynamic, alive, loving, exciting, and excited. This is your responsibility. I love this. If you look to a code to tell you what to do, you will end up being conflicted in your desires. You believe that God cares in the most, my, in the most minute detail what you do with your sexuality, but he doesn't care. That is your business. That's going to go flying in the face of so much of what y'all thought. So um, just breathe, 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 right? He does not care any more than your neighbor should care. He, he has only one concern, and that is that the quality of your awareness, your power, your love, your compassion if you have been following the rules and find yourself angry, negative, resentful, or judgmental, do not think that following the rules has put you in harmony with the divine. I like that, right? So maybe, look, maybe that was why I opened this book because somebody needed to hear that this morning. Um, but let me, uh, let me find... Oh, where is it? You know, sometimes um, when you read some of this stuff, it just flies in the face of what you thought you knew. Um, and so I am so glad that there are audacious people out there who will, you know, tap into that space within them where they can share this information with you. And not everybody is in that position. Why am I not seeing this? Maybe it is, um, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. Oh. All right. Um, life is not random. It seems like it should be right here in this section. Um, and this book really is talking a lot about just being able to trust your feelings, being able to trust the intuition and the intuitive hits that you receive. And so when you are in that space, ah, here it is. Here it is. This is what I wanted to read to you. It says the best game the ego has is the spiritual game. This game is incredibly powerful because it makes you superior to everyone around you. Why? Because you are seeking God and everyone else knows that to seek God is the highest good. 
So you seek God and you feel powerful and stronger and wiser and more and more holy until finally you find that the people around you can't stand you. You are so holy that your presence makes them feel angry or guilty. And it is all because your ego is going on endlessly making assessments and judgments. Remember, there are no rules for anyone. Enlightenment happens as it happens when it happens. If the rules work, you would have already been enlightened. <laughs> if the rules worked, but they don't, rules are built on one person's experience of enlightenment. And so this is part of, this is, you know, when, when, I, when I say that I'm not a rule, I'm a rule breaker, it, you know, I don't know that it, I've always been a rule breaker. I'm not even going to tell this lie that I read this book and started breaking rules because I was breaking rules when I was in elementary school because it was just who I was and what I did. Um, and so I think that in part, that is the reason why I can sit here and talk to you about, be a minister and still talk to you about sexuality and religion and, and the head games that it has done on us. It's the ways in which it has been used to oppress and suppress, right? And so when one person finds something that works for them, then the implication is, is that they want to make it universal so that then it should work for everyone. And that is not the case. If, you know, one of the things that, um, that, that um, I, I learned early on is if you are resentful about something, that resentment is communicated in everything you do. It, it becomes something that informs how you show up. So nobody wants your resentful presence at, at a church. You, you're supposed to be going there and being happy. If you're not bringing happiness there, find what makes you happy because the happiness vibration is what needs to go out into the world. The love vibration, the forgiveness vibration is what needs to go out into the world, not your resentfulness, right? So, um, ah, so... I'm glad, I'm glad I found that and, and that whole thing about the codes and the rules that we learned. Anyway, so Sandy was talking about, she was going on about how she had spent six years in this ashram and in India. And we see people sometimes who spend days, weeks, years, go to church all day long. And they are some of the most judgmental, hateful, um, um, can, you know, comparison uh making people that you want to meet they try to have what like jesus would say they have a zeal for god but don't have a clue about god right and so what 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 i try to explain to people is if i can't see god in everybody i ain't seeing god because now I need to be about the business of how do I love my neighbor? How do I love everyone around us? And I can't do that if I don't love myself. If I'm judging myself, if I'm caught up in my own judgments about myself, I can't help but judge you. And so, so part of this work is coming to this place where we are working on self. And when I say that... Um, um, no people pleasing, but, but I also say that there are no private thoughts. You may think that you are not sharing an idea with me or not saying to, to me something, but if I can feel your contempt or if I can feel your judgments, um, then, then I can feel it. It's, it. Whether you say it or not, right? Whether you say it or not. And, and, and here's the other thing too that, that came to me last night as I was, um, I, I said something very insensitive to my neighbor yesterday. I thought it was very insensitive and it was just like, yeah, just flip. And, and the moment it came out of my mouth, I knew it, that it was insensitive, right? So, you know, I, I struggled with it because she walked back in the house without saying anything, right? But I struggled with it because I was like, mm, 
who am I, right? Who am I? So last night I sent her a text and I said, hey, I apologize. That was really insensitive of me. And she says, yeah, I know you didn't know. And I said, yeah, but I knew better, right? Um, I knew better. And so I needed to apologize. And it was something, something what, okay, so, so I'll tell you what I said. She had, she had gone and she was in the hospital and, you know, she's a workaholic, right? Always working. I mean, sometimes I could be out there at 4.30 in the morning and she just coming in or she just leaving out or whatever, always working. And so, um, so she had been in the hospital and um, when I, I, I finally see her and I said, well, I hope you at least got some rest. And her face just looked at me like, like whatever, right? And so I knew, I, I, it, whether, whether, whether her face showed it or not, I knew that it was not something I should have said. You should have got some rest, but whatever. That's just dumb, right? So that was why I needed to apologize. It was like, it was a dumb statement. Um, and it may have come out of my wanting, you know, thinking that she was overworking herself, right? Um, it may have come out of a good place, but it just wasn't a good thing to say. So I was apologizing. And so I was just saying that I knew better. I know better. And so I'm going to take responsibility for what I say, right? I, and, and so last night I was going through this thing of, you know, let me own that. Let me own that I was out of place. Let me say that and, and demonstrate what it is that I know. Because even if she never said to me, ooh, Sandra is saying that was offensive, right? Even if she never said that to me, I felt I felt the offense taken in my spirit, right? That's part of that intuitive, no, that is part of that connectedness. That is part of knowing that this person that is before me, I can't separate out and say that this person is, is you know, this and this person is that. If I don't see myself, if I don't see God in them, then how can I possibly see it in me? And so my, my challenge is always, what I tell people is, is that the way that, I approach this thing, uh, spirituality, is not by making it seem like God is some places and not in others or judging us. I try to see God in everything and everybody. And until I make it, what, what, it, what, is, that, what is it that um, Gene Houston says? Until I democratize God and see God spread throughout the earth, in all, through all, as all, until I get there, I'm not there. Until I get there, I'm not walking the spiritual walk. And so my challenge is, is that even when you are popping off some darn firecrackers at two o'clock in the morning, to still see God in you, right? To still respect that place in you that knows that God is there. God is present. And this is how God is showing up. And sometimes as God is that clown that's poking you and saying, okay, what do you believe now, right? And so until I'm there, I'm not there. So for me, that was one of those, that was one of those necessary, like, ooh, let me check that. Let me check myself, right? And, 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 and whether or not, whether or not somebody knows that your feelings, your judgments or not, ah, we all, we're connected. And so this idea that we have private thoughts or separate thoughts, or we're not, yeah, y'all, we, you know, do, we got to do better. So when, as she was sitting here and she was telling this thing about, um, you know, uh, six years in the ashram in India. Okay, cool. Right. She meditates twice a day. Okay, cool. That's, that's wonderful. Right. Wonderful. And so um, she says, uh, Carolyn says, in a private moment, she asked me if I received an impression about where she should live or how she should earn her living now that she was back. And so Carolyn asked her, why weren't you receiving that type of information if you're doing all this meditation and you're getting all of this stuff, right? Why are you asking me? <laughs> I, I mean, that was, I mean, it's, it's, it's it's such a, a real question, right? 
um, you, people will come back to me and tell me, well, God said, well, sweetheart, I hear God talking to me every single day. If God wants me to know something, I don't need, a, a, you don't need somebody else to come and tell you what God says to you, right? And so, so, so this thing about, she was like, Carolyn uh, says, I'm, I'm not adding occupational counseling to my specialty. She was like, I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you way to go, you know? And so she was like trying to say to her, no, you know, it, you've been sitting on a pillow for six years, right? If, if, if you've been sitting on a pillow for six years and you meditating and you're doing, and you're getting all these messages, why are you asking me? And so let me, I, I want to tell you what, what Carolyn says, because I, I could tell you what I think, right? Um, and so she, the woman said to her, well, I only get guidance in spiritual matters. Is that not a spiritual matter, right? And, 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 and here's what, sometimes what we do is, is we get, we get a clue. We, we, we in, get intuitive hits about what it is that we should do and where we should go. And you know what we do? Yeah, not that. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. Mm -mm. I, I, what? No. <laughs> not, that's what we do. That is what, right? Uh, that's just, mm -mm. How, how is that going to look, right? Because you might have to put on jeans and brocades. Or it might take you out of what you were so proud about, about how you get your, your sense of worth, what you hang in your hat on, right? Doing that, <laughs> right? But wait a minute. So let me, let me read what Carolyn says. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going on. But her occupation was part of her life. I objected and therefore was part of her, um, I objected and therefore was part of her spirituality. She said that she just couldn't get that type of information. And then I asked her, well, what's the worst possible intuition you could receive in your meditation about what, where you should live and what you should do? And instantly she responded, that's easy. Go back to teaching in the inner city of Detroit. I'm actually, I've actually had nightmares about that. I said, oh, wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. I want to make sure I'm reading this right, right? Because I don't want this come, come across wrong to y'all. Then I asked her, what's the worst possible intuition you could have in your meditation about where you should live and what you should do? And she instantly, instantly responded, that's easy. Go back to teaching in the inner city of Detroit. I've actually had nightmares about that. I said, I'd, I'd consider doing that if I were you. It sounds like guidance to me. A year later, I received a letter from Sandy, me, Sandy telling me that after my workshop, that she had been plagued by urges to go back to teaching. She fought them so strongly, she ended up developing migraines and a sleep disorder. <laughs> Meanwhile, she was earning a living as a clerk in a bookstore, which did not pay her enough. So when she received an offer to do some substitute teaching in her former school district, she accepted. Within two months, she introduced an extracurricular class on meditation to high school students that met twice a week after school. The class was so successful that it was put into the regular curriculum the next year. Sandy delightedly signed a teaching contract her migraines and sleep disorders ended shortly thereafter. So now through all of this, this is, this, this is what the, the interesting thing is, is that sometimes what we do, sometimes what we're meant to do is, is, um, is right there before us, but we get crud kicking and screaming, thinking to ourselves, there is no way, no way. Look, I mean, right here, we don't know who this lady was other than her name was Sandy, other than she had, 
It wasn't me, right? Other than, and don't call me Sandy, I don't like Sandy. Other than um, she had gone to India and, and I've gone to meditation retreats. I've done those types of things, but here she is and she's getting these intuitive hits, but there's a part of her that is just rejecting this. We do this all the time. I know I, I remember um, Miriam Williamson um, used to talk about how um, when we pray for something, the answer shows up and then we don't like the answer. So we'd be like, yeah, no, not that, right? No, mm -mm, I'm not doing that. I'm not dealing with that. I'm not, no, not him, not that, not, not. We go through that. And I will tell you that sometimes, uh, <laughs> what is that statement? Thou doth protest too loudly, right? So sometimes when you have those visceral reactions, to something, maybe that's your ego that's rejecting it and not necessarily your spirit. Because what your spirit deems good and what your ego deems good is probably two totally different things. So sometimes what we have to do is we have to really check ourselves um, to see Oh, to see what was to see what's going on. Oh, Gretchen, good morning. I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm just now seeing that the radio man is is interfering with my broadcast again. I don't know why my screen is so small that I can't see the comments or see anything that's coming up. Let me pull that down a little bit and see if that helps. Um, you know what? I'm going to have to get after Radio Man again. I have said something to, um, there's a man who who lives behind me and this, his antenna for his um, shortwave radio broadcasting goes up above the houses over here. And I have changed out my speakers and done a whole lot of stuff to accommodate um, the fact that I was, you know, I could be in my house and all of a sudden hear him on this, um, this thing at 12 o'clock at night, mojo man, mojo man, you know, and I'm thinking, what the heck, you know, and, and, and to hear that when you're living, when you live by yourself and you're home by yourself, and then all of a sudden it breaks into, your speakers or subwoofers or whatever is just crazy. And so I actually got rid of that set of speakers because it was so annoying. My neighbors tell me that they hear him coming through their television sets. So I have gone around there, knocked on his door and I haven't, um, I, I talked to the woman he lives with and um, I've talked to him before about it. But I talked to the woman he lives with the last time, and apparently she doesn't, maybe she didn't convey how serious I was about that. So there are FCC regulations that prohibit that type of thing. But I always hate um, getting litigious, uh, litigious, litigious on people, right? Um, because what tends to happen in my community is, is that it doesn't always turn out well for Black folks when you pull in or start talking to um, the law about stuff. It doesn't end well. So I'm, I'm always hesitant about taking it to the next level, but um, I will speak to him again about that dog on radio because uh, that really is annoying. And I don't know when it impacts because I do my radio broadcast from here too. Um, and so if I'm doing my radio work, I should not have to at worry about whether my neighbor decides that he wants to play on his, um, on his radio on a given day. So um, thank you for, for saying that. And I, I do like to keep track of yeah, of that. So, um, so belief in oneself is required for healing. Belief in oneself is required for healing. Now, I will say to you that that can be a challenge depending upon, you, so, so I recognize it's not like something that happened just like that, right? 
because sometimes what we're doing is, is we are trying to heal years, if not decades of, of stuff, right? Let me, um, and, and, and I always try to take this back because I want to, here's what we do. Sometimes people get upset with their parents saying that my mother said this, or my mother told me, or my father, or we, we get upset with our parents without recognizing that our parents' parents and their parents were doing things or saying things in an effort to keep you safe because they loved you. We have grown up in a culture that has not been safe for you. And so in order to keep you safe, they were constantly telling you about staying in your place. Don't get too big for your britches. Um, you know, don't, don't try to, you know, don't try to outshine anybody, right? We, we got those messages and it, it may not have come out like that, but it's in essence what it was trying to say. And sometimes that is the idea behind it. The idea behind it is to push you down, to put you down so that you don't get yourself in trouble. Could you imagine if I was born back during slavery time, I mean, I, I look, some of y'all might say, oh, you would have been in the house. Um, well, whatever the case may be, I am not a compliant one. I am not compliant. I am not that girl. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, but, but you need people like me, right? You need people like me to push the envelope. And, and, and when, so if, if I'm talking about something, um, if I'm sharing something with you, sometimes it's because sometimes I think like, who else has the audacity to talk about your sexual health or your sexuality? Who else has the audacity to sit here and tell you about um, conversations and stuff that other people sit up there and they be like, oh, oh. Oh, I've never, right? Nobody goes into church and talks about sex and 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 your body and and why you feel a particular way about your body. Nobody talks to you about that stuff. And here I'm trying to normalize what we whisper about. I'm I'm really trying to get you to a point where you see that some of the judgments or some of the things that you've learned, the codes that you have been learned. I just, just dumb if you look at them. I mean, how do we, how do we demonize something that all of us do? Some, if, if it's sex, right? Sex is how we procreate. Sex is how we give life. And yet we make it sound like it's so dirty and so ugly or something that needs to, you know, we need to whisper about it and hide behind something. I mean, does it make sense to you? And so there will be some people that'll say, yeah, that should be, you know, that should be totally off the table. That shouldn't be something that you talk about. But if you don't talk about it, then it becomes like I, like I said, that stuff, right? That's in the back of your refrigerator that's giving off a foul odor. So you know something in there is wrong. Something in there is spoiled. Something in there is bad. You know it's in there. And just because you close the door real quickly or put an extra thing of baking soda in there doesn't necessarily make it go away. And so sometimes the only way to do it is to pull it out and heal it. Do whatever it takes to, in order to deal with it, not let it linger and stink. And so if you're miserable, if you're upset, if you are unhappy in your life, if you're, you know, grumpy, 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 um, maybe it is because there is some stuff that you need to work out and work through and, and ignoring it is not working through it. Pushing it down is not working through it. That's swallowing poison. So the best place for it is out, right? It reminds me of a story my, about my, uh, my brother. <laughs> he was, uh, 
I, I tell this often because I thought it was so hilarious when he said it to me. He was like he went to a house party and and um and my both my brothers, my both my younger brothers graduated from Chanel. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, he said he went to this house party and, you know, football team, basketball team, they, they hanging out with folks, um, you know, whatever, mixed races, everybody. He, so they went to this party and he says, and he said, these crazy people, he says in the, in the basement, they got a really nice basement, basement all hooked up nice and everything. He says, everybody sitting in there. And he was like, he told them, he said, I got to use the bathroom. Now, my brother, when he got to use the bathroom, he got to use the bathroom, right? And so he said he got to use the bathroom. And so he goes, they point to the bathroom and the bathroom opened right into the room where everybody was sitting. And he was like, he was like, what the hell? He says, I I guess I couldn't ask him for a bathroom in another part of the house. He was like, so I went on in there and he was like, <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, you know, when he went in, everybody was laughing and joking and having a good time. He says, when he came out, he said, he looked at the faces and he was like, people was looking at him like, <laughs> like, how good? <laughs> he said <laughs> so <laughs> he went in there and did his business and <laughs> and he says and the people he said he came out he was like they was all frowned up and everybody was quiet <laughs> like <laughs> like he had assaulted him you would have thought he came out with a shotgun or something <laughs> but but you know, he says he says the only thing I could think of was better out than in. He was like, because if leaving it in, he says, I would have been miserable. He was like, by letting it out, he says, you know, all of us may be miserable for a second, but it'll it, it you know, it'll disappear. It'll be it, just just wait. It'll it, it ain't gonna stay, right? And so um, and so sometimes we have to recognize that there are certain things that are just natural to us. And, you know, in, um, in, in when we, when we recognize that there is this, you know, what's there to be so caught up on, right? My sister is one that even though I'm her sister, we grew up together. She cannot use the bath. We go traveling and she will not use the bathroom if I am in the room. It's as if she'll ask me, why don't you, can you go down to the lobby or can you go someplace else? Because I got to use the bathroom. I mean, she actually says that. I mean, she can't use the bathroom with anybody else. And it's the most natural thing in the world. Everything does it. Everybody does it right but but there is some part of us that that has disowned even our naturalness it doesn't it doesn't make rational sense to me right um but that's where we are and so there is this level of self acceptance that we have to see that 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 stops bastardizing ourselves throwing and trying to get rid of what is natural about us you guys are sexual beings. You are natural beings. There are certain processes that regardless of, yeah, we should learn how to not, you know, just lean over and pass gas and we should learn what's appropriate, not belching and, and you know, and, but there are certain things that are natural to us. And to sit up and, 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 and cast judgment or dispersion over somebody. <sighs> that says more about us than it does about them, right? And so, um, so all of this stuff. So belief in oneself is required for healing. Before I realized the significance of self-esteem for developing intuitive skills, intuitive skills, I would have stated that faith is the most important factor in healing. I now equate faith with self-esteem and personal power because low self-esteem reflects one's lack of faith in oneself, as well as in the power of the unseen world. Unquestionably, faith is vital for managing the challenges of our everyday existence. But belief in oneself is required for healing. So I, I think sometimes we just try to, and, and here's the other thing, because faith sometimes is this, 
no faith is uh, now faith um the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things yet unseen right we know that a lot of times we will have more faith we try to have more faith in in God than we do in ourselves. And one without the other, hopefully that's what you see. One without the other is like putting an oxymoron together, right? Because you, you are the lensing point of God consciousness here on earth. You are the lensing point. That is a Gene Houston quote and it's so powerful. Because what I, what I try to get in myself is, is that the God flows through me, right? God flows through you. God flows through everything and everybody. And in recognizing that, that we know that sometimes I may be the vehicle of the blessing that you're seeking. And sometimes you may be the vehicle of the blessing that you're seeking, but that the vehicle is necessary. So when somebody pray, prays a prayer, right, or says something, there is the answer that shows up, shows up as or through somebody else. And so without the confidence to, to, to get the intuitive hits, um, I got, I got uh, a couple of minutes before I got to get off of here. I'm, I'm going to tell you guys the story. You probably, maybe if you've been listening to me um, anytime you've heard before, I've got some really powerful examples of being used. Um, and let me see which one am I going to tell y'all. Um, I'll tell y'all about... Hmm. Oh, I got so many. Um, I'm going to tell you all about the kids, right? I'll tell you all about the kids, right? So um, one day I'm down on 30th Street, East 30th, and I'm picking up my friend Dobie. And Dobie was coming over to my house for, um, I don't know what he was coming over to my house for, but Dobie didn't drive. And um, I'm gonna tell y'all, I'm always moving because I'm always trying to show y'all stuff, right? Ah. So this is not, oh, this is one of Dobie's um, pieces of art that he did. Dobie has since passed. Um, he is no longer, well, he's passed. He, he's no longer on this planet. But I was going to pick up Dobie and, um, I need to have that framed. Uh, I was going to pick up Dobie. And um, so I go down there, pick him up on 30th and it is winter time, it's cold outside. And um, I go down there, I drive down there, pick him up. And on the way back, um, on the way back as I'm coming up to a 30th and Woodland, it is as if the air just changed for me. And he was talking and I couldn't even, um, I couldn't even concentrate on what he was saying because it, something changed. And I heard in my ear, pick up my kids. And I'm thinking like, what? You know, what is that? Dobie didn't hear it because he's still talking. And so I'm thinking to myself, what is that? And so I, I, I'm like, okay, so I made the left turn onto Woodland. At the time, you could still turn left right there. I made the left turn onto Woodland. And, um, but now I'm in my zone because I'm trying to figure out what is that, what was that statement that I heard? Don't, you know, so pick up my kids. And so then I, as, as I'm coming and approaching what I think was 40th, I heard again, don't pass up my children, right? Don't pass up my kids, I think is how it came. Don't pass them up. And so as I'm going past, it might've been 36, as I'm going past, I'm looking at these kids sitting in the bus stop as I'm driving past. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, shoot. And, um, and I heard it again. I'm hearing it clearly in my ear. 
right? Dobie is still talking. So I put my hand on his leg and I said, I'm sorry. I said, there's something I got to do. And I made a U-turn and I turned and I went back and then I turned again. And Dobie is looking at me like, what do you want to do? I said, and I rolled down the window and I said, hey, where are you guys going? Two, there's like four kids standing out there at the, at the bus stop and it's it's like nine o'clock in the evening and it's cold outside and they're standing out there at the bus stop and I'm thinking I'm saying where are you guys going and they said um the street was um they told me the street and the street is right over there by Shaker by Shaker Square or by the Shaker Rapids and um and, and so they told me where they were going. And I said, get in. And, you know, Dobie had to get out and they got into the back seat and, you know, all of them piled in the back seat. And when they all got in the car, I'm like, I look back at them and I'm, I'm like, okay. I said, so y'all got to tell me where, where y'all going. What are you doing out here at this time of night? And they were like, we trying to get home. And, you know, I'm having a conversation with them and I'm just, you know, going on and going on. And I was like, well, you know, I'm saying to them, I said, yeah, I know y'all shouldn't get in a, in the a car with somebody, um, a perfect stranger. And they was like, yeah, we know. And so I'm, you know, I'm going through and, um, and the little girl, she's saying to me, and she was the oldest, she's like 12, little girl is saying to me, she was like, yeah, um, we missed our bus. And so we needed to get home. And I'm saying, well, I forget how it went. I, she was just telling me that. And she says, we have been standing there. And, I, you know, for me, I was like sitting up there thinking to myself, I didn't really care about that. I'm just having a conversation with the kids. And, and some of them were little. One of them looked like it might have been like four or five. And so they were like all stair steps and ages from 12 down to about four or five. And, and it's late at night and it's cold. And, you know, and so I'm just kind of like doing, you know, what I thought, you know, having a conversation that I thought I should be having with them about getting in the cars. And she was like, well, we have been praying for a ride, right? That's what she said. We have been praying. And all I could say was in that moment, well, prayer answer, right? Because Because it's one of those things where, you know, God operates through us. You, you may be the vehicle one day, right? Um, God, when, when God speaks, you know, you know, whether you call it God or spirit or, or unseen hand or unseen force, you have to be in the space where not only do you hear it, but that it's not whether or not, you know, whether I, I'm not going to turn to Dobie and say, did you hear that? Because it wasn't for him. It was for me. It was for me. I was in the driver's seat. I had the car, right? It was for me. Sometimes it might go to him because if I was not a person who was accessible, it might go to him and he might say, hey, Sam, pick these kids up. But that was for me. And so you've got to have the courage, the self-esteem, the, the wherewithal to when you hear something to be able to respond. And the more you're able to respond, when you respond, the more you get, right? It all goes hand in hand together. So, um, so this thing of, of belief in yourself being required for healing, um, even that too is important. Sometimes you will not be able to hear your own guidance. Sometimes other people will hear it for you. You still have to have the courage to follow it through. But, but we don't, you know, so many, so many people don't, right? That's musculature, that's spiritual musculature that has to be developed to know that it'll be all right, right? That, that sometimes you have to do the things that are necessary in order to get you to the place where you desire to be, even to get your own prayers answered. Yeah, sometimes it's that too. Anyway, I got to go. Um, I will talk to you again tomorrow. Um, we will pick up right here. Um, it looks like there's supposed to be another lady named Janice that I'm talking about next, but 
Um, I'm going to put a little hash mark in here. Today is the 30th. Wow, are we already in July? Man, okay. So um, yeah, Dobie was an amazing artist. Thank you for that. Actually, um, I had a nude done by Dobie that is on my wall. And um, so I got two of his pieces, um, that one and, uh, and the nude that he did of me, but he was, uh, he was, he was, he, he used to, yeah, he used to do a lot of, um, of art and, uh, he was a great poet and there was a lot of good stuff about him, but he also, um, he had bone cancer and, um, yeah, yeah, anyway. Good guy, good memories, all of that. Anyway, so, hey, Sarika, thank you. Have an amazing day, you guys. Um, I thank you for being here. I will, um, I'll be here tomorrow, same time. God willing, the creek don't rise. Um, so I'll see you then. And, uh, and if you have any questions or any comments, you can always either post a comment or um, inbox me. You know, I'm, I'm available. All right. Love y'all. And, uh, and thank you for, for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Right. You know, um, I'm sending you blessings. I done blessed myself. So just cause you looking at me or thinking of me or, you know, or this is, is landing with you. I'm, I'm knowing that you're blessed already. And so I thank you for, um, yeah, for your continued, um, support and blessings as well in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I go in here and deal with this carpet again. Yay. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um, yeah, all is well. All right. Talk to y'all later. See ya.